party on. <laughs> wow. Uh, last week, my wife Marianne and our 14-year-old Sam and I, we spent most of the week in Branson, uh, the, the Rochester Rockets 14U baseball team. Uh, played in a tournament down there last weekend, and so we kind of took an extended trip. We spent four or five uh, days down there, and last Sunday at eight o'clock, so like right now during this time, Sam was playing in one of the the, uh, tournament games down there, and whenever he plays in the games, my job is to do what's called Game Changer. Game Changer is an app, and so I use my iPad, and what I do is I score the game, and while I'm scoring the game, it keeps the team's stats, and so that's kind of like my volunteer role as a dad on the team is to, uh, is to use Game Changer and uh, uh, score the game. And so when I'm doing that, I sit on a bucket there in the dugout, in our dugout, and I sit in the doorway of the bucket so that I'm able to see everything uh, really well. And so last Sunday, it was about the fifth inning, and I was minding my own business. I was scoring the game using my iPad, and, and uh, one of our boys hit a foul ball. Now, I think the ball came off the bat about 120 miles an hour, all right? Not really, because these boys can really only hit it about 75 or 80 miles an hour, but it makes the story a whole lot better, okay? And so one of our boys hit this foul ball, it was 120 miles an hour off the bat, and he pulled it so much that I was sitting in the doorway of the third base dugout, and that ball was coming right for me at 120 miles an hour, all right? And so I tried to employ my fastest reflexes to keep from getting hit, and it did not work. I took that ball right off the shin. And let me tell you something, that hurt, all right? But what hurt even worse was when I tried to avoid getting hit, I leaned back real quick. And when I leaned back, the bucket tipped. And I'm here to tell you, this is like it happened in slow motion, all right? I was like on the edge of the bottom of that bucket for what seemed like eternity. And so I started swinging my arms. My feet were up in the air. I threw my feet down to try to get all my momentum to go forward because I did not want to fall off the bucket. And after a few seconds, I realized I'm going down. And I went down and I hit the ground and I hit the ground hard. I landed on my backside. That hurt. But I made all this commotion. My feet went up in the air. I knocked over all the bats there in the dugout. I mean, I just made all this commotion there in the dugout. Now, we don't have any, I know you're going to be disappointed in this, but we don't have any video of me actually getting hit. But we do have some live stream video of the game last Sunday, and I want to show this video clip to you, and I want to show it to you a couple of times so you can appreciate what happened, all right? So here's the first time, and so that's, that's one of our boys that's uh, hitting there. It wasn't Sam, by the way, lucky for him. So there's the foul ball, 120 miles an hour. Now, see where the ball is? It's back out on the field. The pitcher, see the pitcher? He's going over, and right there, he bends over and picks it up. Now, I want you to know that that's what happened after it hit my shin. So it did not hit the bucket. It did not hit the fence. It ricocheted off my shin and made it all the way back out on the field like that, all right? So I'm telling you, 120 miles an hour, okay? Now, I want to show us again, watch the, watch the opposing coaches down the first baseline. You can see them kind of up there against the fence. They're all sitting on their own bucket. Boom, I get hit. There goes the ball. Now, all three of those coaches, check them out. They're like, oh, no. Big old guy just got hit and knocked off the bucket there in the dugout. <laughs> and they were so concerned that one of them comes up to me after the game, and he's like, are you okay? Because that thing was coming in hot. And I'm like, yeah, 120 miles an hour. All right? Now, here's what I learned last Sunday. I learned that when you get hit in the shin by a baseball like that, it hurts. And I learned that when you fall off the bucket, it hurts. And when you're on the ground, the view from the ground is really not that great. It's pretty deflating. But here's something else that I learned. Those Rochester boys, they were so kind to me because as soon as I hit the ground, they're all around me. They're like, are you okay? Are you okay? And then one of them reaches out his hand like he's going to pick me up off the ground. Now, look at me. And he's this little 14-year-old kid, right? And so I said, so they're all like, are you okay? Are you okay? One of them reached out, and I'm like, you know what? Okay, guys, everybody just take a step back. Let's take a breath for a second. The bucket was laying, you know, on its side right there in front of me. I said, I'm going to move the bucket, and then I'm going to get up, and everything's going to be okay, all right? And so they all kind of, you know, gave me a little bit of space. I moved the bucket, And then I went over and I sat down back on the bucket. I kind of brushed myself off. And the next thing you know, Mary Ann is right here (laughs) on the other side of the fence. And she's whispering to me. She goes, are you okay? I said, yes, I'm fine. Do you need some ice or something? I said, I'm good. 
Now, it's at that moment that I learned that she started laughing at me. (laughs) And before it was over, she was laughing so hard that all the other teen moms were laughing at me too. And I'm here to tell you, I did not think that it was funny at all. (laughs) And so I took a shot to the shin, and I got knocked off the bucket last Sunday. Does life ever feel that way? Like maybe you have this moment, or maybe you have some moments, or maybe you have an hour, or you have some hours, or maybe you have a day, or you have a few days, or maybe you have a few months, or, or maybe you have a lot of months, or maybe you have a year, or maybe you've had years, right, where all these different things have happened. You've had these different facets that have happened in life, and it just feels like taking a shot to the shin and getting knocked off the bucket. Like maybe you feel that way spiritually. Like the devil just keeps coming at you and at you and at you, just temptation after temptation after temptation after temptation. And somewhere along the way, you make a bad decision and you give in and you sin. Or the, or the devil just keeps attacking you and attacking you and attacking you. And you just feel like you're in the middle of this spiritual warfare. And before it's all over, you just think spiritually, I'm not sure I can take it anymore. And it feels like you took a shot to the shin and you've been knocked off the bucket. Maybe it feels that way for you emotionally. Like maybe you were really excited about a new job and then you find out you didn't get it. Maybe you had high hopes for one of your kids and then they let you down. Or, you know, maybe you, uh, uh, maybe you did something that was right and then later on you suffered for it. And so the frustration and the anger and the confusion and the disappointment that, come with, that comes with that. Or maybe you struggle with depression. Or maybe it's anxiety. Or maybe for you it's jealousy or maybe it's pride, right? But you've got these different emotions that conjure up these difficult feelings. And, and so you, just, you know you struggle with these things and you just feel trapped like day after day after day. You just struggle and you struggle and you struggle. And before it's all over, you are emotionally drained, right? And, it just, and, and maybe sometimes it even feels like it's going in slow motion. And it just feels like you've taken a shot to the shin and you've been knocked off the bucket. Maybe it's like that relationally for you. Like maybe you have a marriage that didn't work out. Or maybe you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or you were dating a a, a boy or a girl and and you thought you were going to marry them and then they come along and they say that one one phrase, right? Maybe we should start seeing other people. Or you're hurt by a family member in a way that should never have happened. Or you're betrayed by a friend and it feels like You've taken a shot to the shin and you've been knocked off the bucket. Friends, today we're going to kick off this new series that we're calling Second Chances. And what we're going to do in this series over the next few weeks is we're just going to talk about what can happen when you feel like you've taken a shot to the shin and you've been uh, knocked off the bucket. And what I want you to know is that when you've taken a shot to the shin and you've been knocked off the bucket, as much as it hurts to get hit in the shin, as much as it hurts to fall off the bucket, as deflating as it might, might feel, as, as bad as the view might be from the ground, what I want you to know is that Jesus is there holding out his hand, ready to lift you up. He's ready to give you the second chances that you need in life. And so knowing that he's the one who holds out his hand to lift you up, I want us to go to John chapter 14, and we're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to read down through verse 7. What I really want to do this morning is I want to take most of our time and I want to focus on verse 6 and I just want us to look at what Jesus says about himself knowing that he's the one who gives us second chances, that he's the one who's holding out his hand and he's lifting us up, all right? And so John chapter 14, here we go, verse 1. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now I want to stop right here and talk about this for a second because when we get to John chapter 14, There's a lot that's already happened with Jesus and the disciples. Understand, this takes place during the last week of Jesus' life and ministry. There's all this stuff that that, uh, Jesus has told his disciples. In fact, when we get to John 14, this is on Thursday. He's going to be crucified on Friday. There's all this stuff that's happened up to this point. And so Jesus knows that his time has come. He knows that he's going to die, that he's going to be crucified. And so he wants to prepare his disciples. And so he starts to talk to them about the fact that he's going to die. He starts to talk to them about the fact that the time is coming and, and, and he's no longer going to be with them, that he's going to leave them for a while. And then they share in this last meal together, and that's what's happening here 
in John 14, but they share in this last meal together. And so there's all this stuff that Jesus tells his disciples during this last meal. He, he tells them that one of them is going to betray him, going to help hand him over to be crucified. And the disciples, they just can't believe what Jesus is saying. And, and then before it's over, he even tells Peter, you're going to deny knowing me three times, Peter. And so Jesus has been telling them all this stuff during his last few days. And, and and, and, and there's so much that he's, that he's laid on them that the disciples, they're, they're basically freaking out. And so he starts this conversation off. He says, listen, guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. And then he goes on. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, well, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so as we begin this conversation, just talking about these second chances, I want to focus on what Jesus says here about himself because when we get knocked off the bucket, he's the one who's got his hand extended to us and he's ready to lift us up. And so when you came in today, if you grabbed one of our bulletins on the back, there's some space where you can fill in some blanks and take some notes if you'd like to do that. There's also a place where you can do that in the RCC app. So let's just talk about this, Jesus giving us second chances. I think Jesus can give us second chances because he is the way. Jesus says that he's the way. I want us to go back to verse 3 because there's something that I want you to notice here. After Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to go and prepare a place for them. Look at verse 3. Look at what Jesus says. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way. So I want you to, I want you to understand what's happening here. Jesus says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you know where I'm going, so you know how to get there. And Thomas is like, whoa, 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 wait a second, Jesus. We have no idea where you're going. And so if we have no idea where you're going, then how in the world can we get there in the first place? And so Thomas is kind of confused, right? And in the midst of his confusion, Jesus looks at him and he says, I am the way. You just got to follow me. And so here's what this tells me. Jesus never brings confusion. He always brings clarity. Jesus never brings confusion. He always brings clarity. Now, Jesus never brings confusion, but you know who does, right? Satan, the devil, he always brings confusion. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, the God of this age, so Paul's talking about the devil here. Listen to the confusion that he brings. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan works really hard to bring confusion, doesn't he? I mean, he doesn't want us to see Jesus. He he doesn't want us to see the glory of Jesus. He doesn't want us to see the salvation that Jesus brings. I mean, what Paul says there is that Satan works so hard that he wants to make sure that unbelievers don't see Jesus at all. It was Paul who also said Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So he pretends to be someone he's not. And so he always brings confusion And so, friends, we need to trust in Jesus because he always brings clarity and he's the only way to the Father. We need to put our trust in Jesus and what he's done for us. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus tells his disciples here in John chapter 14. I want you to go back to verse 1. Even in the midst of all this crazy news that he's given the disciples over the past few days, look at what Jesus says. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe. By the way, this word believe that Jesus uses here, it means to trust. And so Jesus says, you trust in God, trust also in me. Now that word that Jesus uses there to trust, it's a word that literally draws this picture that like we trust that Jesus is able to do something. So if we believe that he is the way and we're going to trust in him, what that means is, is that we believe that he can bring salvation to us. We believe that he's the one who can rescue us from our sins, right? We believe that he has saved us from our sins, and he is saving us from our sins. And so we have to trust in in him because of who he is and what he's done for us. You know, a verse that many of us have known probably most of our lives, look at what Jesus says. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now that's the part that we all know and love, right? But Jesus goes on. 
He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So there's a lot of clarity there, isn't there, with Jesus being the way. I mean, Jesus says, believe in me and you're saved. Don't believe in me and you're condemned. And so he always brings clarity because he is the way. And so we have to trust in him because of his sacrifice. Talking about Jesus, look at what John says. He says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, he gave his life for the sins of the whole world. What that means is, is that he gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. And so he's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to be saved. He's the only way to get the second chances that we need when we've taken a shot to the shin and we've been knocked off the bucket. And so we need to trust him as the only way. And so I think we get these second chances from Jesus because he is the way. We also get second chances because he is the truth. Jesus goes on in his response to Thomas here in John 14. Look at verse 6 again. He says, I am the way and the truth. And so Jesus never brings confusion. He always brings clarity like we just talked about. You know what else? Jesus never brings deception. He always brings truth. And he always brings truth because he is the truth. Now, you know who brings deception, right? That would be the devil. Look at what Jesus says about the devil. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you hear what Jesus says there about Satan, right? He says, there's not there's there's not even any truth in him. And if he's speaking, if he's talking, he's lying. It's as simple as that. And Jesus never brings deception. He always brings the truth because he is the truth. So why would this be so important for us to know that Jesus is the truth when we're talking about second chances? Well, I want you to look at what Jesus says in John. Chapter 8, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so Jesus says, look, if you're truly my disciples, you're going to hold to my teaching. And then he says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then he says, anyone who sins, so who sins? All of us, right? And he says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. So, so we're like captured by sin. We're like, we're like in this bondage to sin, right? Like this, like, like this sin has some kind of a, uh, almost like this sin has some kind of authority over us. And so we're enslaved to sin. This sin controls us. But then Jesus says, ah, but wait, if the sun sets you free, you are free. No question. And so we have to understand that when Jesus says he is the truth, he's offering something very special to us. He's offering this freedom, and it's this freedom from sin that's found in Jesus. I love what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I love that. We are not these condemned sinners when we are in Jesus. And Paul says, you've been set free from the law of sin and death. And so you've been set free from sin. You're you're not condemned because of your sin. Now, we have to be very careful here, and we've talked about this before, but knowing that we've been set free from sin, like the sun sets us free, we're no longer enslaved by sin. What we have to make sure we understand, though, is that doesn't mean that we can just go out and sin as much as we want. Right? That's not what Jesus is saying there. It's not about sinning as much as we want. It's about now we have an opportunity to choose not to sin. That we're no longer enslaved to sin. Sin does not control us anymore. But now we can choose his righteousness. And so friends, when Jesus says that he is the truth, he's offering something very special to us, right? He's offering freedom. And I mean, here's what I want to make sure that we understand. When Jesus says that he is the truth, he gives us freedom from sin. He sets us free from the penalty of sin. We're no longer these condemned sinners. We've been set free. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So we're not condemned. And Paul says, no longer are are we dead in our transgressions, but now we're alive. We're alive with Jesus. 
And so we're set free from this penalty of sin. We're also set free from the power of sin. We're no longer this slave to sin, but now we can choose righteousness. Now we have the opportunity to please God, to do what he wants us to do. The Hebrews writer says, without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so the Hebrews writer says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So what does that mean? What's the flip side of that? With faith we can please God, right? And so we're set free from this power of sin. We're no longer enslaved to sin, but now we can choose righteousness. We can choose to do what it is that He wants us to do, and we can please Him. And so we're set free from the penalty of sin. We're set free from the power of sin. And then one day we're going to be set free from the presence of sin. Friends, I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day when my eternal life is fulfilled and I'm just like Jesus. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. And so what that tells me is that the lowly body that fell off this bucket last Sunday, one day I'm going to be transformed. I'm going to have this glorious body like Jesus. And I'm going to be set free from the presence of sin because look at what John says writing about heaven. He says, nothing impure will ever enter it. Nothing. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so because He is the truth, We're going to be like Jesus and we're going to be set free from the presence of sin. And so that's the freedom that we have because he is the truth. We're set free from the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. And so we get a second chance because he is the truth. And then finally we get get second chances because Jesus is the life. He's the life. Let's go back to verse 6 again. As he is responding to Thomas here, look at what Jesus says. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so... Jesus never brings confusion. He always brings clarity. He never brings deception. He always brings truth. And then he never brings death. He always brings life. And he always brings life because he is the life. Now, don't don't misunderstand. I mean, Satan, he's he's the one who brings death, right? And he's going to try as hard as he can to bring death. But the Bible is clear that Jesus has conquered death in the grave. But he's still going to try, and he's going to try, and he's going to try to bring death to us, to bring death to us, to bring death to us. But the Bible is also clear that Jesus came, and he destroyed the devil's work. And so listen, friends, in Jesus there is nothing but life. And so when we are in Christ, we have this incredible life that he offers to us. The Bible says that he has the light of life. Talking about Jesus, John says, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so when we're in Jesus, we have life. When we're in Jesus, we have the light. And John says that the darkness will never overcome the light. So Satan can try as hard as he wants, but the darkness is never going to prevail. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, Jesus rescues us from the darkness, and when we follow him, we will never walk in darkness. We have the light of life. The Bible also says that we have this newness of life. I want you to know that God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus. Not one of his sons, but he gave up his one and only son, Jesus, to give his life for you. And so Jesus comes and he lives this perfect life. And then it happened just exactly the way that Jesus said it was going to happen. Judas betrays him and helps hand him over to be crucified. And so he's arrested and he's tried and he's tortured. And then Jesus goes to the cross after he lives this perfect life. He goes to the cross and he sacrifices himself for you. I mean, understand, he died so that you could live, right? 
And so he sacrifices himself for you. He dies, and after he dies, they put him in the tomb, and he's in there, and then on the third day, he rises again. He comes back to life, which is what we're going to celebrate next week on Easter Sunday. We're going to celebrate the resurrection, but he comes back to life, and now you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, he stands at the door of your heart, and he knocks. And the question now becomes whether or not you're going to let him in. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks and the question is, are you going to open up the door? I mean, look at what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So understand what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I'm standing at the door of your heart and I'm knocking and if you open up the door, I'm going to come in and we're going to eat together. And so it's this picture of this intimate, personal, this, this, this extremely close relationship that you can have with Jesus the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Son of God, right? And there's nothing more that He wants than for you to open up the door. There's nothing more that He wants than to be able to walk into your heart. There's nothing more that He wants than to have a relationship with you. But hear me on this, okay? Even though there's nothing more than He wants than to have a relationship with you, He's not going to kick down the door of your heart. He's not going to force His way in. He wants you to open up the door of your heart and let him in. And if you'll just open up the door and let him in, you'll go through an incredible transformation. You get a new life. You get a new life because Jesus is life. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I love that because Jesus says, you know what? I didn't come to get. I came to give. I came to give you this full life. I came to give you a life that's full of so much meaning. I came to give you a life that's full of so much purpose. I came to give you a life that's full of so much significance. I came to give you a life that's full of so much joy. I came to give you a life that's full of so much peace. I came to give you a life that's full of so much hope and freedom and purpose. But you've got to open up the door. And you've you've got to let him in. He says, I came to give you a life that goes on forever. I mean, think about this for just a second, all right? And I know we talk about this in here from time to time, but I think it's worth repeating this morning. Jesus gives us this life that goes on forever. And so what that means is that when you are in Jesus, when you die, and unless Jesus comes back first, there's a day that's coming for all of us, right? None of us can avoid this. When you die, when you're in Jesus, that's not the end of you. It's actually just the beginning of you. Jesus talks about this eternal life with his disciples here in John chapter 14. I mean, go back to verse 2. Look at what he says. He says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at this. I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Now, can I, can I just be real honest with you for a second? I don't know that I totally understand all that. I, I don't know that I can totally wrap my mind around exactly what Jesus says there. Me, a sinner. Jesus, the Son of God. And He's preparing a place for me. And because he's preparing a place for me, he's going to come back and he's going to take me so that I can be where he is. I mean, in this life, I don't feel like I always have a place. And in this life, there are people who don't want me around and I know who they are. But with Jesus, I always have a place. And he wants me to be with him forever. 
I don't understand it, but I'm overwhelmed by it. And here's what I want you to know. He has a place that he can be getting ready for you too. And he wants you to be with him forever. But I have to say this. It would not be right for me to end this message and not say this, okay? You can only have that place and you can only be with him forever if you only have Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other way to heaven. This is not something where all roads lead to heaven. Jesus says, I am the only way to the Father. I mean, I want to make sure, don't, don't get upset with me because this is not my decision. This is not my opinion. I mean, this is what Jesus says. Go back to the text one more time, verse 6. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one. You know what that means in the original language? No one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, Jesus is the only way to the Father. He's the only way to be saved. He's the only way to eternal life. He's the only way to have second chances. And maybe you've come in here this morning and you're limping, right? You've come in here limping this morning because you've taken a shot to the shin. Or maybe you're on the bucket right now and you have been on the bottom edge of that bucket for what seems like eternity and it seems like everything's just happening in slow motion and so you're swinging your arms and you're throwing your feet forward trying to do everything that you can to keep from falling off. And maybe, just maybe some of you are here this morning and you've already fallen off and you've hit the ground and it hurt. And you don't like it down there. Because the view's not very good. And it feels pretty deflating. I mean, you may be sitting here and you may be thinking, there's got to be more than this, right? There's got to be, there's got to be more to this life. Well, you know, there is more. You can have more purpose. You can have more meaning. You can have more significance. You can have more joy and more peace. You can have more hope, freedom, and purpose. You can have a life that goes on forever. But it's only found in Jesus. And so he's the one who has his hand extended out to you this morning, and he's ready to lift you up. You can have a second chance because of Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? <clears throat> We're going to sing a song together here in just a moment this morning, and uh, while we sing this song, I'm going to be roaming around at the back of the room, so I'm going to be back behind everybody. Nobody's going to be able to see you. And if you just want to talk today about having a relationship with Jesus, like maybe you realize Jesus has been standing at the door of your heart, and he's been knocking for a long time, and you're ready to open up the door, right? You're ready to have this life that goes on forever. You're ready to know the, the way and the truth and the life. You don't want to be this condemned sinner. Then just come find me back there, and we'll just spend some time talking. We'll talk about what it looks like to have this relationship with Jesus that can change your life. I mean, hear me on this. You can walk out of here today changed literally forever and that happens through Jesus and so just come find me uh, while we're singing now many of us in this room we've made that decision right at some point in time we opened up the door and Jesus came in and so we're here and he's in our he's in our heart and we have this close relationship with him but we know someone who needs that relationship we know somebody who doesn't hasn't opened the door of their heart. And there's no better time to extend an invitation than right now to those people. I mean, Easter Sunday is next Sunday, right? So people are more open to hear about Jesus on Easter Sunday than any other time during the year. And so I would guess if I went around the room, all of us know at least one family member or friend or we know a co-worker or we know a neighbor who needs to find the hope and freedom and purpose that Jesus brings. And so I'm going to give you a moment. We're, we're going to pray, and I'm just going to give you a few moments, and then I'll close our time by praying. But during those few moments, I just want you to pray for that person. Just pray for that person by name, and just pray that God would show you the opportunity that you have this week to extend an invitation to them, and just pray that they'd be receptive to them.
expectation. And listen, it's as simple as this. It's as simple as just going to that person and saying, hey, you know what, why don't you come with me next Sunday? Just, just come and see what it's all about. And so pray for that invitation, and then uh, I'll close our time, and we'll pray together, and then we'll, we'll sing this song together, all right? And so let's pray. Take a moment to pray for somebody in your life who needs to know Jesus, and then I'll close our time. Father, sometimes life is just, it's just hard. And there are moments when it hurts. There's these moments when we get hit in the shin and it hurts. There's these moments we get knocked off the bucket and it hurts. But Father, we're so thankful to know that your son Jesus he gives us these second chances. We're so thankful to know that while we're on the ground, He just extends His hand to us to lift us up. So we thank You, Father, that He is the way. And we thank You that He is the truth. And we thank You that He is the life. We thank You, Father, that He's the only way to come to You. And Father, we're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed by your love for us. We're overwhelmed to know that when we are in Jesus, that he's preparing this place for us and that he will come back and he'll take us to be with him forever. And so we thank you, Father, we thank you for that hope that we have. We thank you for this hope of a life that goes on forever. And we thank you, Father, for this freedom that we have, with this, this freedom from the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. And we thank you, Father, for this purpose that Jesus brings to each and every one of us. Father, there may be some of us who are standing here and we sense that your son Jesus is knocking on the door of our heart. I pray, Father, that we would have the willingness to open up that door, to let him in, to have this close, intimate relationship with him. And so we thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for those in our lives who need to know him. We thank you, Father, for the opportunities that you give us to extend these invitations, to just simply say, just come and see. Come and see what this is all about. We just pray, Father, that they would be receptive and open and accepting of those invitations, that they too one day might open up the door of their heart and let in the way and the truth and the life. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he sacrificed himself for us, that he died so that we could live and so that we could have this hope, freedom, and purpose. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.